Hello, friends. My name is Jane Hochelle, and I'm the worship director of the Three Rivers campus of our church. I am so glad that you are joining us here. You know, because I'm a person that works in ministry, it can really be a challenge to find myself in environments where there aren't other believers around. It is such a blessing and a gift to be surrounded by friends and coworkers with the same beliefs as me. But as a believer, how can I follow the instruction of Psalm 96.3 where it says, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples, if I am only talking to those with similar beliefs? I know I have personally challenged myself to evaluate where I am spending my time other than church or with like-minded people. What I discovered is that I have a lot of opportunities to share the gospel that I have not thought of before. I would challenge you to do the same. What are some places that you can be intentionally thinking and praying about sharing the gospel? We are going to join together in worship and after we do, we will be taking communion together. So go ahead and take a moment to look around you for elements that you can use. Now, let's worship together.
Communion is a time for us to remember and reflect on the sacrifice of our Savior for our sins. It is the very essence of what we believe. You know, we do not worship a God who keeps his distance and doesn't know about our struggles, but we worship a God who has experienced pain, who walks with us in our grief and has experienced it himself. What a wonderful Savior he is. Luke 22, 19 through 20 says, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to worship a God who meets us in our pain and promises to walk with us in it. We know that you have experienced pain and suffering and grief and that you promise that there will be a day coming where we won't experience that anymore, where every tear will be wiped away and we will experience fullness of joy in your presence. And as we await that day that is coming soon, help us to pursue you, to worship you with all of our might and to grow in our love and adoration for you every day of our lives. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Welcome back to the Compass Church and to our series called Forecast, a study of the six epic events that are prophesied in scripture. You know, we're trying to understand what is to come because in understanding what is to come, we can find joy and hope and excitement in the present. Friends, I want to greet everybody, a big greeting to everybody at the South Naperville campus, Hinsdale people, Bolingbrook, Three Rivers, Naperville, Wheaton, Sheridan Prison, and everybody online. Let's dive into a study of the highest level of importance. Friends, today we are going to be studying the Great White Throne Judgment. This event is all about who gets into heaven for eternity and does anything matter as much as that? People chase after lesser things in this life, but I contend that the most important thing is are you right with God and headed to his paradise when you die? That's the topic we're going to study. And to do so, I need to tell you a story about something that happened regarding stairs and an elevator. Recently, my wife and I took my parents out to dinner. And it was interesting, the, the hostess said, hey, we've run out of tables on the main level. So we've set a table up for you on the second floor dining room. Now, my parents are 81 years old. And so when I saw there were two ways to get upstairs, the elevator and the stairs, I said, hey, mom and dad, why don't we take the elevator? My mom was offended. She said, Jeff, 
Griffin, we may be 81 years old, but we can still do the stairs. And I'm like, okay, let's do the stairs. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> hey, the stairs are the elevator. This simple decision represents the most important decision spiritually that we'll ever make. Here, here's the deal. Uh, symbolically, we're, we're separated from God like he's on the second floor and we're on the first. He's holy and perfect. We've fallen, which means we've sinned. We've morally messed up. And as a result, there's this broken relationship. And most people try to solve this reconciliation by the stairs. They're planning to get to heaven when they die. And in fact, to get right with God today, it's I'm going to climb the stairs and accomplish the solution on my own. And by the stairs, that symbolizes here that they do good works. That's what the Bible calls it. Try to live a good life. Try to earn right standing with God. You know, like go to church and say a prayer and be loving and serve people and honest and maybe give a buck to charity. And they're like, I got to have earned right standing with God. In fact, if you ask most people, do you think you're going to go to heaven when you die? They'll say, I hope so. And if you ask them what gives them that confidence, they'll say, well, I've tried to live a life that's good. I'm not perfect, but I'm better than most. That's what they're saying. And that's all stairs. That's you trying to live a good life and reconcile the problem. There's another way. Jesus, his whole religion is about him providing reconciliation. He's like the elevator. To lean on Jesus is to depend on a power outside of yourself to get us to God. And it turns out that Christ came and when he died on the cross, he was paying the penalty for our sin, our rebellion. Jesus was like, what, what if you leaned on me and I took care of the problem rather than you? Do you see the difference? Friends, uh, they're radically different. This is about self-reliance. This is about Christ-reliance. And it turns out that only one way works. People might assume, well, you can go either way. No, you can't. It's like God has locked the door at the top of the stairs and you can't get to him that way. No kidding. Let me read you a verse. This is from the Bible, Galatians 2.16. It says, no one gets right with God by doing good works, but rather only by trusting in Jesus. Fascinating. God has made it so that the only way to get to heaven and to get right with him is to abandon all effort to impress do the stairs and turn to Jesus and let his power do for you what you can't do for yourself. Now, this is a little humiliating. Remember, my mom was all blustery. I want to take the stairs. Spiritually, we were the same way. We're like, listen, I made the problem with my own sin. I, I need to clean up the mess I made. I'll, I'll live a better life. No, it doesn't work. We must come to the end of any notion that we can earn a right place with God and abandon all hope that our good deeds will get us anywhere and instead turn only to Christ and say, Jesus, you're my only hope. I'm, I'm clinging to you alone. Friends, wouldn't you agree? The most important thing is figuring out how to secure your place in heaven forever. So it's time for us to study the Great White Throne Judgment. Friends, today we're going to be studying out of Revelation 20, starting in verse 11. John, remember, John's the one who gets this vision of heaven and the future events. He said, I saw a great white throne, hence the great white throne judgment is what it's called. I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And I saw the dead great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and the dead were judged. Friends, uh, do you see, everybody uh, after death is going to have to stand judgment in this epic 
event. It's as great or small. It doesn't matter if you're important in the eyes of the world or a nobody. We're all equal uh, before the throne of God. Just so you know, this glimpse that John has of this great white throne judgment is not the first time we find out about it. Back in the Old Testament, the prophet Daniel, look what he saw. This is Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10. Daniel said, I watched as thrones were put in place, and the ancient one sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow, and his hair was like the purest wool. And then the court began its session, and the books were opened. Do you see that? God has been conveying from the most ancient of days that there is a judgment coming. And friends, this is the big judgment. This is the great divide where God will separate the people from believers and unbelievers, from his children and his enemies, from those going to heaven and those going to hell. And this is a very unpopular tenant of the Christian faith. There's a lot of people who are really struggling, like, oh man, this whole who's in and who's out and who's going to heaven, who's going to hell, that is so cold and harsh and unpopular by many people. And so let's dive into it. Let's see if we can wrap our minds and our hearts around this. If you think about it, this necessity to divide humanity into two camps, it's a logical necessity. God has to choose. You know, the thought of who gets to be with God for eternity. The essence of heaven that makes it wonderful is being with God. Does everybody get to be with God? In it? Well, here, I have a cup here that has thousands of BBs in it. Let's imagine that these BBs uh, picture humanity. And this, uh, this is a handmade glass vase. And we'll use this as a picture of heaven, of being with God forever. Uh, I've got a mason jar that we'll use as an image of not being with God forever of hell. Some of you are collectors of mason jars and deeply bothered that I'm using this to symbolize hell. I apologize, but just trying to make a point. What's God going to do with the eternal destiny of all people? One option is that he could have everybody go to heaven. He, he could say, everyone's saved, you're all in. In fact, universalism and universalistic Christianity teaches that, that everybody eventually is right with God and goes to heaven. There's part of that that's real attractive, but there's another side of it that's just like, really? We know of historically evil people. Adolf Hitler comes to mind, serial Killers come to mind. Do we really feel good about them enjoying paradise forever? Does evil and rejection of God have no place in consequence for eternity? Other people have said, no, 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 what, what he should do? Uh, actually, <laughs> let me restate that. No one has said that this could be, but it was an option that God had, and that is to damn everybody. Let's just face the fact that everybody's a sinner and put everybody in uh, hell, separated from God for eternity. That's another option. What's the third option? The third option is that some are in heaven and some are without God in hell. That's the option God has chosen. Now, the, the whole question of who and how many, that's where it gets really sensitive. You know, a lot of people are like, very few should go to hell, only the most evil people. But what is the most evil people? You know, some would say just a few more. And oh, they, yeah, that person who bullied me, yeah, they, they should clearly not be blessed. And then there's this, this whole question of how do we decide? We can't decide. God decides. And that's what this passage is all about. Let's, let's dive into it a little more, huh? This whole formal courtroom, I do find it a little ironic that here we are studying courtroom drama on the week of the death of O.J. Simpson, who, you know, was the subject of the trial of the century, you know, just wildly 
popular for those of us who are old enough to remember it. Uh, why, why the formal trial? You know, formality of trial, even in the Bible here, it, historically and in, in, in God's choice to separate in a courtroom, the, the intent is to provide the masses with confidence that justice has been served. You know, you've heard of a lynch mob where people try to administer justice based on their guts, you know, without due process. No. In a courtroom, at least ideally, the evidence is presented and justice is served. Justice for all. Well, you know, you can debate as to whether that was done with the OJ situation. But in the case of this trial, which OJ will stand before the Lord as will we all, Justice will be served. In fact, I, I love where uh, the, the passage calls it the great white throne. Why great? Why white? Well, what's, the idea is purity and excellence. This is justice that is perfect. God, uh, the gavel here, <laughs> symbolizes justice. And the Lord says, I am going to make sure that justice reigns. In fact, God wants to prove to everybody on that day that he didn't wrong anyone. On that day, in that formal courtroom setting, all the population of the earth will realize God did what was right. They may not feel about it now, but in that moment, he's going to show us all that he handled this right. All right, with that said, let's read verse 12. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Oh, that's interesting. The books. Well, it turns out that there's this set of books in heaven that detail the deeds of all humanity. God is watching and remembering and knows what we've all done. And there's a sense in which you didn't hide from God. You know, you may have hid from humanity and they don't know the, the truth of what happened, but the Lord knows. Now, you know, books, that's kind of an antiquated form of data storage. We, we know about uh, computer technology and maybe in heaven, who knows exactly what form the data is stored in. But Books related to the audience there, and it relates to us. God's pointing out that there is a record of everything we've done. And it's not good. <laughs> Anybody who's hoping to say, oh, I'm, I'm going to get to heaven based on the good deeds I've done. Admittedly, the record is mixed. You know, each of us have good things that we've done. But there's bad things that all of us, have, we've all sinned. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 3.10, there is no one who always does what is right. Not even one person. Or Romans 3.23, everyone has sinned. We all for, fall short of God's glorious standard. The standard to which we're measured is God, his glorious standard. To be excellent and loving and faithful and honest and true. God says, be like me. And we fall short all the time. We fall short. There's recordings of us falling short in doing the things we were told not to do. And we fall short in not doing the things we were told to do. And so sin, friends, there's a record that demonstrates all of us are sinners. I, I remember getting a ticket in the mail. You ever been blessed by a little mail uh, from the police department who says, yes, there was a video camera at the intersection that caught you violating the law. In my case, it said that I had run a red light. And I'm like, I don't run red lights. No way. I don't do that. I am going to fight this. And then there was a little place. If you would like to watch a video of your traffic violation, I clicked it. No, oh, there's my pickup truck, sure enough, approaching the intersection. Oh, I'm approaching and the light is yellow. Oh, yep, it was red before I entered the intersection. And suddenly my righteous defense was like, ah, yeah, I did. I did it. And similarly, there will, anybody who wants to try to build a case that I'm not a sinner, the Lord's like, oh, shall we go back and see? 
And friends, there are sins that we remember. There are sins that we don't even remember. But the record stands. The truth will prevail on that day. And it's not good. Galatians 2.16 says, No one is made right with God by obeying the law. When it comes to good works and living a life that shows no sign of spiritual... Not, none of us are perfect. We've all messed up. And as a result, we're sinners. As a result, we're rebels. And nobody gets right to God and gets to heaven by living a really squeaky clean life. Now, good news. <laughs> There's more. Shall we read? Verse 12 says this. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. All right, now, friends, there are the books that records our deeds as to the good and bad that we've done. But there's another book called the book of life. Well, let's find out about this book, shall we? First of all, in verse 15, there's a mention in the negative. It says, those whose names, whose name was not found written in the book of life. So it seems that it's a book of names written. Sure enough, 10 other verses in the Bible referred to it as, you know, whose names are written in the book of life. So you want to know the content of the books is the deeds that we've done. The content of the book of life is a list of names, Okay. What's up with these names? Well, they are the names of the people who get eternal life. Remember, it's called the book of life. So here are the people who get life, who get eternal life. And now the next question is, how did they get eternal life? That's the key. Was it by being good enough and making the cut? No. It's interesting. Uh, elsewhere in Revelation, both in chapter 13 and chapter 21, a little more is added. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay, the Lamb's Book of Life is what it's called. The Lamb? It turns out that throughout the Bible, the Lamb is a reference to Jesus, specifically the crucified Christ. You see, the Lamb, that was an uh, object of sacrifice in the Old Testament system for centuries. They bring a Lamb to the temple in Jerusalem and they bring it to the high priest for sacrifice and the priest would say, place your hand on the animal's head and symbolically their guilt was transferred to the animal and then the animal was killed paying the death penalty as a substitute for them. Must have confused them like crazy. But then when Jesus arrives, you may recall John the Baptist sees Jesus and he turns to the vast audience that John had been teaching and John says, Behold, look at that guy. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And everybody was like, oh, he is the Lamb? All the Lamb sacrifice that we've done was pointing to him? You see, they had been expecting a Messiah to be the Savior. And by Savior, they thought the Messiah would come and be a military leader and conquer evil rulers. But Jesus came not to conquer. Jesus came to be sacrificed. He saves through being sacrificed, through dying on the cross on our behalf, like the lamb that was sacrificed at the altar. And so this cover of the book that says the lamb's book of life, it's a reference to those who are connected to Christ and his sacrifice. Just as the title of a book on the cover relates to the contents within, so the lamb is connected to the list of names of those who are getting eternal life. Do you see the connection? The only way to get in the book is to trust in the Lamb. Friends, it uh, turns out that, I'll go back to the elevator stairs uh, illustration. You've got to come to the end where you abandon any hope of climbing the stairs, of getting right with God based on your good works. And you've got to come to a place where you say, I'm not relying on the books anymore. I'm only relying on the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. I'm placing all my trust in an elevator, a power outside of myself that can bring me up to God for eternity. And that power is the shed blood of Jesus Christ on my behalf. 
And on this day, uh, this clarity will be brought to everybody that God is not going to differentiate on, oh, you're almost good enough, but not quite. So you're the BB, that the last BB that didn't make it. No, it's not going to be about, did you make the cut? It's one question. Have you trusted in God's provision, the grace-based solution of Jesus Christ on the cross for all humanity. Anybody who boasts and I think I'm good enough to get in, you're out. Anybody who falls in repentance and says, I know I'm not good enough, and Lord, I need your grace expressed through Christ, you get your name in the book, and that's how you get in. Well, let's read on, shall we? Verse 15. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire. This is an imagery of hell, and it's terrifying. You know, the, the, the imagery of the lake of fire, it turns out that it's not real common. It's only used by John in the book of Revelation. Jesus did talk about Gehenna fire. There was a uh, garbage dump outside of Jerusalem called Gehenna, and fire from the methane decomposing garbage would burn there. So flames were used of hell, and people have always wondered, is, is that literal? I don't think it is. You, you can disagree with me on that point. I believe that the essence of hell is the absence of God. You, you may be aware that uh, in John 17, 3, it says eternal life, it's knowing God. The essence of eternal life of heaven is being with God. The absence of life of hell is the absence of God and his loving presence. And so I believe that the essence of hell is eternity without God. But that is so terrible that the Lord has used imagery like fire to convey, avoid this destiny at all costs. Part of the reason I think it's symbolic is that there's a, a number of places where uh, four places, actually, where hell is described as utter darkness or outer darkness. How can it be fire and darkness? Both of these, I believe, are symbolic injury, just saying it's terrible. Avoid it at all costs. Well, so the people who are not in the book of life are taken away to their eternity without the Lord. What happens to the rest? Well, let's find out. Here's the next verse of what's proclaimed from the throne after non-believers are removed from the courtroom. Verse 3 of Revelation 21. Then I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look. God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. Oh, what a shout. Their name is in the Lamb's book of life. And the proclamation is made, welcome to paradise, the home of God, whom you will enjoy living with now for the rest of eternity. What a moment. Oh, friends, is your name in the Lamb's book of life, nothing else matters as much as that. The day will come when all will see how critical this response to the grace-based offer of Jesus really is. You know, I had an interesting experience. Just uh, yesterday, I got back from Florida. I was able to get down to Florida with my family a few days this week. And we invited one of Janae, my middle daughter, one of her friends with us. And as we were coming home yesterday, we were at the ticket agent in the airport, you know, checking our suitcase and getting boarding passes. And they quickly provided boarding passes for all my family, but the ticket agent says, we can't find the name of your friend. I was the one who ordered the tickets, but I ordered, she, she joined us later in the plan, so I had ordered, ordered them later and I'm like, oh no, did I put her on the wrong flight? Did I do something wrong? I'm panicking. And she's looking at me. So I'm trying to stay calm and look real cool, calm and collected, you know. And the lady's pecking away on the computer. I don't see her name here. I don't see her name here. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> the, uh, the lady said, oh, sorry, here it is. And she said, here is your boarding pass for your ticket home. Whew! Oh, the joy of seeing your name is on the list. 
Friends, I want that to be your great joy at this great trial and my great joy. I, you say, I hope it's so. You don't have to hope. You don't have to wonder. You can know. Some people wait. I'm waiting for that experience of feeling saved. You don't have to wait. You don't have to. It's a decision. It's a choice that you make. Jesus extends the great offer of the Lamb's Book of Life and says, anybody who's willing to abandon confidence that they're good enough and instead recognize their sin and turn to Jesus as the only way to solve the problem, you will find in Christ forgiveness. And as you pledge your life to him, you'll say, I'll follow you as Lord. As a free gift, in a moment, you can choose to say yes to the offer of reconciliation with God through Christ. It's a decision that you can make right now. And so let's do it. Let's pray. And I challenge you, if you haven't already, get right with the Lamb. God, we are so grateful for this glimpse into the great white throne judgment. And we see that your justice is perfect. And we see the wisdom of your ways. And we ache for that day when the list of names in the Lamb's Book of Life will be read. And Lord, there's some who want to get on the list right now, understanding that there's a path of reconciliation with God that's not about earning it, but rather about relying on Christ to forgive and lead our lives. There's a group of people who want to say yes to that right now, to decide to place faith in the saving work of Jesus right now. And say, Jesus, you're my only hope. I'm not relying on self and my goodness. I'm relying on your grace and your forgiveness extended towards me and my broken life. Be my Savior and be my Lord from this day forward. This is the hour of salvation. The miracle of grace-based reconciliation with God. Lord, we give you thanks for it. We pray this in your name. Amen.
dressed in his righteousness alone fall is stand before the throne joining us today from wherever you are joining from know that we want to connect with you go ahead and scan the QR code with the connection card so that we know that you've been here if you need prayer for anything at all we have a team that would love to be praying for you and there's a section on the connection card to fill that out as well thank you also for your financial gifts that help us continue our mission of helping people to find and follow God here at the Compass Church we so appreciate you partnering with us in this way. We love you and we will see you next week.